Hi everyone, how are you? Welcome to my channel. I'm sorry and I apologize for being up against white again and I hope it's not really hurting anybody's eyes too badly because I could not change it. It's a backdrop and they're on huge rolls in my studio. So I have to get that I used, and this is what I used, just a little background. I told you I'm a hobby photographer. I really got into photography when I had my fourth baby when I started to use a DSLR camera and the love was immediate for the camera and the baby but I loved it so much and then I kept saying you know I used to take my kids into the studio and I'm like I can recreate that in my own studio and I did and I had such a blast doing my own so I have huge rolls of backdrop but they're big because depending on what you need, you know, you need to roll it out. So they're really heavy and I need my husband to help me get them up there. And he's out, he's out right now at a meeting. So no go, apologize for the white, try to get it changed for you by the next video. I really had all good intentions of filming in my kitchen because I know a lot of you like that. But guess what? There was a two hour school delay. So of course that delayed me. And then by the time I got some more research done and everything for what I wanted to talk about, kids were home. And believe me, it's too noisy. So we'll see what happens with that and let's just go with this for tonight, okay? So we've got the backdrop issue out of the way. One more tiny housekeeping issue to talk about just because it's in the comments. Someone mentioned that they couldn't find part two of something or there is a playlist with all of the true crime videos in it and someone had said, yeah, something like, oh, I wish you would categorize your videos because I'm finding an unboxing for something and you don't have to watch my unboxing videos. You really don't. If you want to, I'd love you to. And um, I am going to have to do a Degusta box opening in the next day or so, okay, because I do have sponsors I work with on my blog that I do that for. But you don't have to watch those videos unless you want. If you want to, you can. You don't have to watch how to make a Corvette ice cream cake at home or any of those other videos. If you're here as a true crime aficionado and that's all you want to watch on this channel, you, you know, I welcome you to do that. And I'm putting everything in a playlist so that you can easily find the true crime videos. And just like I have them all categorized, so I don't know why person couldn't find them but I did leave the link right on the comment so I hope that I don't remember who it was I hope that you could find those now and you don't have to worry about you know sitting through one of my unboxings okay <laughs> you can go right to the true crime and all the true crime videos will be loaded in the playlist okay but this is a lifestyle channel so there will be other types of videos on this channel but I will categorize all the true crime into their own playlist so those that are not interested in anything else do not have to be bored to tears with anything else on the channel okay that's the first we did the backdrop we did the playlist i've got to stay on oh yep and somebody told me i'm, I'm having a great time now that i've just let these whatever hateful comments go. I really haven't received a lot of them after that. I mean, I have to say, uh, there's a few, of course, that come in every day. And uh, most of them are not really bad that need to be reported or anything, maybe one or so, or so here and there. But most of them, I'm just having a good time in the comments answering people. On that note, I want to just say I'm having I'm having more fun, I guess, dealing with the not truly hateful comments, but the nitpicky comments not bothering me. Um, you know, I'm answering them and having a good time with it and just, you know, de handling it with a sense of humor. Like I try to handle most things, if you haven't noticed. So somebody said to me tonight, oh, that did you know that you ramble on and on too much and your videos are too long and you should less is more. Haven't you ever heard that? And so I just said, well, you know, it is in my name, ramblings after all. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, most people ask me to make my videos longer, but 
different strokes for different folks and that's why YouTube has so many channels but thanks for stopping by and letting me know so I am having <laughs> I am having a good time with that and like I said there's really I'm um, very blessed there really haven't been a lot of very hateful comments coming in and so you know but I'm just letting them roll off and I, I thank you guys for all your comments the other night because that was really nice when I was having an issue and I really think that issue that I was having was due to listening to that hellacious podcast, not getting sleep, then making the whole video where it probably was divided because I was really upset in that first video. I mean, it was crying and everything from that podcast. That's how badly it affected me. So then when I recorded it the second time, <laughs> I had even less sleep and, you know, it was just aggravated from the whole thing with the video. So I apologize for that because... It was a little long-winded and I was upset, but we'll move past that. Okay, so tonight, what I want to discuss is, we're going to be on the Chris Watts case right now. We're going to talk about his father's interview before he went in the room with Chris, when Chris confessed. And we're going to talk about Frankie and Frank Rusak's interviews and we're going to do some just compare and contrast what was said and go along those lines and talk about that and then what I want to do is bring in another case okay we, we have Kelsey Barrett that we've been covering but there's really not much happening yet of course we'll bring you any updates as they happen but there's really not a lot to discuss on that case yet so I brought three cases with me tonight and I'm going to throw them out to you and then you guys can vote for your, for your favorite that you'd like us first to start covering by just putting it in the comments and then I'll just grab the majority and we'll start from there. So here we can either go Jody Arias we can go into Casey Anthony, we can go into Betty Broderick, we can go into Joel Steinberg case, and or Susan Smith. How about that? So there's five there, okay? There's um, Casey Anthony, Jody Arias, which one did I say? Betty Broderick, Joel Steinberg, and Susan Smith. Okay, so you let me know which one you want me to start covering and that we can discuss together. The other thing is I'm not going, I know that you guys all need your Chris Watts fix because anytime I even try to talk about something else everybody's still discussing Chris Watts and I understand that and I'm not going to take you off cold turkey. So I mean but maybe we'll taper it down a little bit and we'll start going over some other cases so we can keep ourselves all sharp and fresh and the web sleuths that we are together <laughs> okay so let me know which one out of those five that you'd like to cover and we'll mix it up a little bit and then of course like I said anything coming from the Kelsey Barrett we'll add that on now a few of you asked me to look up Chris Coleman and see how he is so similar to Chris Watts now I did look that up and at first I thought I had not heard of Chris Coleman and this happens a lot of times with me because I don't remember the name sometimes but I know the case and somebody asked me the other day about the girl that and I still her name is still not fresh in my head the one that killed uh, shot her boyfriend I remember that one and I said oh no I had never could just start looking at the name and then when of course I looked up I said oh how silly same thing happened with Chris Coleman okay yes I had definitely heard of that case. If you're not familiar with that case, it is, I don't know, there, there's differences and there are similarities, but he was a bodyguard for Joyce, what is it, Joyce Meyer, is it? Why does that name not sound right to me now? The televangelist, is that, do I have Joyce Meyer? I don't know, I'm just, just, you ever say a name and it just doesn't sound right or, I don't know, but yeah, I think Joyce Meyer, Meyer Ministries, I believe it is. Anyway, he was her bodyguard, 
and he was making at the time a hundred thousand dollars and he was the son of two pastors but he didn't marry let's say the girl next door but however his wife who he married who he like eloped with and was pregnant at the time who his parents really didn't like so we have a similarity there right that the parents really didn't like her think that that woman was for their son became part of you know the ministry and she would ha she would go out on um, missions and, and do all kinds of things like that but she had a friend who was also that party girl that the wife was okay in the past and Chris hooked up with her okay th this other Chris and ended up I, I just think there was so th the plot thickens here because there was a lot more premeditation and there were like two different types of storylines going on here and just a lot more at the scene created and he wasn't caught in a split second the way Chris Watts was and now he's actually trying to appeal based on a time and date stamp on the back of a photograph that was never supposed to be entered into evidence and that at least one juror said totally cinched the case for her because she was on the fence so I don't know what's going to happen in that you know I will look into that a little more so we'll see about that but I, I did for those of you that asked me to do that I did do it see I do listen okay so now that I dropped my notes all over the floor I'll pick them up so here's here's what we got tonight okay so Ronnie goes into the interview room He's wearing, the, you know, he's wearing exactly what you saw in the other one. He's got that lightish blue polo shirt with Papa Ronnie on it. And he goes right in. And I mean, basically, as soon as the investigator walks in the room, Ronnie starts saying, oh, he says, how are you or something? And, and Ronnie says, oh, I'm trying to, it. now listen, this man talks so mumbled. I can hear the investigator perfectly. I, I mean, it was like, I can't even tell you guys how I tried to listen to this and, and sat through it a number of times and kept rewinding it, rewinding it. And there, there's only a summary of it. And I didn't want to go off the summary only because the words are changed in the summary. And I think that's very important that to a word that I'm going to tell you about because I think it's important. So I wanted to go through his actual interview and I can say that I was able to make out a lot of it and then a lot of it was still mumbo jumbo and then I went to put the captions on YouTube and my husband and I were hysterical because it was just coming out. It's hit like at one point it was saying phosphates and this. And I said, can you imagine if I just went in there and said, this is what he said. But it, it was so hard to make out what he was saying. So I did the best I could. So the investigator walks in and asks him how he do how he's doing. And he says something like, well, you know, I'm trying to figure things out or I'm trying to figure out what happened. He just goes in there and he says, she was very controlling as far as I know. My wife says she was a narcissist. And the investigator's like, ho, ho, pull back a minute. I'm going to get your name and stuff. Let me get a seat. You know. So I just thought, here's another one that's like Mark. Because it's all what his wife told him. He says in this interview, he didn't see that side of Shanann either. But his wife told him. His wife was crying about it. His wife said Shanann had him in tears. Did you see it? No. She told me. I don't know. I mean, I deal with a lot of people that really want to see something for themselves before they make up their mind about a person. I'm trying to think. Somebody just told me the other day something very similar. They said, and I, I can't think of who it was, but they said, oh, I will never, you know, tell you something about a person if I haven't witnessed it myself and 
you know, I'm not just going to give you hearsay about a person, so you never have to worry about me doing anything like that from anything I hear. I don't remember who that was, but somebody told me that recently. It's good advice. Ronnie should take it. So Ronnie just, like Mark, believes whatever Cindy tells him, whether or not he witnesses or, you know, or not. And it's kind of strange that all of these things happen when Ronnie's not there, when Mark's not there. So, you know, did they really happen? We don't know. We don't know. They ask him when he flew in, and he said, I just flew in this morning. And they ask him, when did he hear about this? How did he hear about this? And so he says, Chris gave me a call. And they're trying to get the date. Oh, it was Monday. And then Ronnie said he got home from work at about 6.30. That's Eastern Standard Time in North Carolina. So it was 4.30 out in Colorado. And just to clarify, Ronnie is not an ex-cop. Ronnie is a parts manager for a, I believe it's a Ford dealership. I, mean, I think it's in Longmont. So he got back from work and Chris called and he said that Chris said Shanann and the girls were missing. And then he goes, no, he said Shanann and the girls were gone. Well, there's that gone that the investigator put missing on his summary. But I think it's important to know that Chris used that gone, the same thing that the mistress said he told her. Because he repeats the same things over and over again. And I just think the gone, gone, is more truthful than missing, right? Because they're gone. That has a lot of different connotations, and I don't think it's a mistake at all that that is the word that's used. Chris also tells him that her car is still there, her purse is still there, you know, her um, cell phone is still there, and he tells, you know, he starts telling his dad details of what happened that we know. It sounds like, and I can't tell you this is for a hundred percent, it sounds like he said, he also told me about the situation with the other girl, or with the another girl, making it sound like he told Ronnie about the affair. But since I can't make it out, and I don't see it in the summary, I'm not a hundred percent sure that's what he said. He went into that they had a discussion, and he, and he goes and says that Shanann knew about the separation. This is what Ronnie says. He said Shanann knew about the separation in North Carolina. He said he, he, that Shanann knew. He said she knew, and she knew that the separation was going to happen when they got back, and that they were going to put the house up for sale, and Ronnie even believed the house was already up for sale. The investigator asked Ronnie if he knew there were any marital problems, and Ronnie says, yeah. Then they go on to, well, wait a minute, let's see, how did Shanann and Chris meet? And I believe he said it was through a friend, though I've heard it's through a cousin, and I think it's a Chris's or Shanann's. I don't know, it was a cousin or something that suggested, I really don't know, but he said I think it was through a friend. And that Chris, you know, went to school and played sports at 18. He went to this NASCAR tech college. And then he met Shanann, and nobody really talks about girlfriends prior to Shanann at all. I, I haven't heard of any. He got a little bit foggy on the details, but that they moved out to Colorado, he said seven or eight years ago, and that they weren't happy about them moving out to Colorado. They asked him if, they've, if he's ever noticed any fighting between Chris and Shanann, and no, they haven't. And... They ask him if they've ever noticed any violence. Did she hit him? Did he hit her? Did they shove? You know, any kind of violent behavior. No. So then he goes on to talking about when Shanann came down to North Carolina. He said she was pregnant. And she said to them that it was 80-20. Okay, there's that 80-20. And these same words just get, you know, nobody ever says anything different. 80-20 and Chris wanted this baby. And they said that when Chris came down, Chris said, no, she wanted this baby. He didn't want this baby at all. It was all of her idea. And he said, but she just does that. You know, she just twists things, turns them around. It's always about her. So that she flips everything around. I'm not trying to put her down or anything. 
you know. But she, it's always about her. She's always flipping things around, you know, puts her own spin on it. He says that everything she posts, her in that Facebook, it's all a big mask. And then he says, you know, and all she did is she sat on her ass on that phone of hers and did her Lavelle while Chris went around and did everything with those kids. You know, he loved those kids to death. He starts talking about, you know, the investigator asked a little bit about what Lavelle was and so he said, so basically she's like a salesperson, what did she do before that, oh she had three other jobs before that, you know, and then he starts talking about, he does give her kudos that her knack is that she's a very good salesperson and she did work in a Ford dealership, he said, and so she did very well with that, he said, well you know, that's her knack, okay. And that he didn't know what her income is, but Chris had mentioned, I believe he said, and again, it's hard to hear him, that it was pretty close to Chris's. And he didn't know Chris's income, but he said that Chris was up for a job um, promotion to foreman. Mm -hmm. The investigator asked, asked um, Ronnie if he knew of any financial problems, and he said no. And the investigator said, well, they ever call you asking to borrow money or anything like that? No. And he explained that his wife and, and he would go out to watch the kids certain times if they want a vacation or something like that. They would go out there. He mentioned, and this was this is another one where I got bits and pieces, something about a birthday party and something about going to Charlotte and getting two Power Ranger costumes, but then coming home and realizing either they, they forgot the head masks in the packages or they just forgot to buy the head masks. This is what he said. And would you believe she said they had to go all the way back there three hours to go get these things and they're just going to wear them for 20 minutes. Who cares? You know, so he was just trying to show that who knows if this happened or not, right? But that it was, she was very controlling and she had to have everything her way. It was always about her. He kept going on the phone scrolling, you know, looking for things. And then he mentioned at least two times that Shanann sent an ultrasound picture. Now, I've discussed this before with you guys. Instead of being happy about it, he's just like, she sent us an ultrasound picture. She's trying to get back, you know, into, um, what did he say? He said, he, as he was scrolling on the phone, maybe he, he saw the ultrasound picture, but he was scrolling for something else to check for a date, and he said, this was when they got back. She sent him a sonogram of the new baby, and at first I thought he was trying to say it came through at 6 in the morning, his time, on the 13th. And I was like, oh, don't tell me you're going to try to go there. But I couldn't hear it, and I, and I don't think, I hope that's not what he said. So he said, sonogram of the new baby, and then it was without a caption. And then he said around 1 p.m. she sent a caption, but I couldn't hear what it was. Okay? And... He said she was reaching out because Chris must have mentioned about the separation. And then later on he talked about that picture again. He mentioned it again. He said, would she send that for us? Something she's trying to get back. She's trying to get back with us because Chris must wanted separation. She thinks she can change it with this. She didn't talk to us for five weeks, meaning when she was out in North Carolina. And he goes, and now she's going to try to, you know, essentially worm her way back in with the sonogram picture. It was just, you talk about perception of someone and they have this horrid perception. Instead of being happy, they're getting a sonogram picture and she's sharing with them and she's willing to make amends or whatever. Instead of, you know, anything like that, it's always think the worst. And they think the worst when they haven't even seen the worst, okay? They're thinking the worst because someone's telling them something that they've never witnessed but yet they've made up their mind about it, even though they've never witnessed anything, just like that Mark guy. So he goes on to talk about this, like I said. He said, um, when he's talking about her in the veil, he's saying that she she's in this pyramid thing and she's got all these people under her and he comes across some video while he's scrolling about, I don't know if it was Cindy reading monkeys jumping on the bed, you know, 10 little monkeys jumping on the bed to the kids. And he's I feel like, it looks sounds like he's showing it to the investigator to say, look, you know, look how well my wife got along with these kids and she didn't let us see them. So he would say that when she would come over, now th I don't know if this is his way, things were good, good, everybody was having a good time, but it was just a matter of time before there would be a blowout. 
and he describes something about how, and this one I couldn't understand. If you guys can understand this one, fill me in in the comments, please, because he says something like, my neighbor passed away and I had to go get flowers and something about either Shanann or someone else leaving a cell phone at the hairdresser and then somebody getting really upset and then his wife being in tears. I don't know. I don't know because it's so mumbled. But then the next one was the ice cream incident. And he says, oh, Shanann was screaming at his wife and, you know, told her father to pick her up. But he wasn't there again. It was Cindy's version, okay? And Cindy and the daughter's version, but he doesn't even mention the daughter telling him. He mentions Cindy. And so, yeah, how true is it? How true is it? We don't know. So he says that after that whole blowout, she had said she's not going back there. She's not going to their house anymore, okay? And I want you to tell, tell you, she told her parents the same thing about getting all the nut products up way high or, you know, and making sure that they're not anywhere where Cece could reach them. And she flipped out on her own brother, you know, and, and he didn't feel bad about it. I mean, he said, you know, it was just, he didn't know. He had, a, he had pistachios out in his room. And he said, well, that's the way she was. And she was always checking wrappers, always checking labels. It wasn't that she, you know, just had it in for Cindy. She was concerned with her child's health, okay? She didn't want her child to go into anaphylactic shock. So, yeah. You know, that's what it was, okay? It wasn't it wasn't anything other than that, but it was taken as a personal attack. And then he said, Well, Cindy said that, you know, this is a good day, right, for to learn to learn this, that you can't always have what you want, and that same reasoning that they used, okay? So because she didn't come back, I guess after they went to a rehab center to see Chris's grandmother, that Either she dropped Chris off at the parents' house or, or what happened, but around, he said, like eight or nine that night, she had asked when his father was going to bring him back, or, and his father didn't want to drive, and his father kept saying, well, what are you going to do now? It's 9, 30, 10 o'clock. She says she needs your help. What does she need your help for this late? You're not leaving until 7 o'clock in the evening tomorrow. You could do whatever it is in the morning. And apparently, so he was all put out, but then he ended up driving, you know, Chris, either halfway to meet her or all the way to Shanann's parents' house. And that was the night, you know, Shanann got very sick on the couch before they were leaving where she was vomiting and Chris was just checked out. I don't know if that time, if this is the time that he supposedly took a picture of that necklace Though I believe that was in Myrtle Beach that he put in his little secret calculator app and they think that the mistress is wearing in one of her photos. Apparently he's telling his parents that he should have done this a long time ago and that Shanann said, Chris, well, how have you changed like this? And he just said, I haven't changed. I just had time to be alone and, and you know, it, it's opened my eyes. This is, again, this is what I'm getting from this mumble jumble. And... You know, he told the parents I should have done this a long time ago and I don't love her anymore. Apparently he told apparently he told Ronnie and Cindy before he left North Carolina that he was done with Shanann, he didn't love her anymore. He wanted a separation, he wanted to put the house on the market right when he got back, that she knew also and he was done with her. But he loved those kids to death. He would never do anything to hurt those kids, Ronnie said, and Ronnie said he loved those kids to death too. Ronnie said he would normally FaceTime with the kids. He never heard of any of either Chris or Shanann ever getting angry at each other, having a big blowout fight where one of them would leave for the night. Never heard of any police having to be involved for any type of a domestic dispute. Never heard of, you know, any problems like that. When asked if she would ever hurt the kids or herself, he said, he said the kids, no, I don't think she'd hurt the kids. He said she really didn't do a whole lot with those kids. About herself, he said he wouldn't say yay or nay because you don't know what happens when a person gets mad. He said he asked Chris different things when they went missing, like about the houses behind them and what was going on there. But he didn't mention any friends or anyone that had a grudge or that would do anything, you know, to harm Chris's family. 
Now the wife said she had a narcissistic personality, she was bipolar. When they asked if he was 100% going to get the separations to his father, his father said 100%. His eyes have been opened and things are not getting any better. He said that Chris deleted his Facebook. He was tired of that. He didn't want any more of that on his Facebook and he just wanted to be done with that. He was tired of her going on there and posting stuff. Okay, I just, I, if I mention this again, I'm sorry, but I'm looking at my notes and I don't know that I mentioned it, so I'm going to mention it again if I did, rather than omit it. Cindy told her husband that Shanann, and I guess whoever else would listen, Mark and everyone, that Shanann was very controlling. She would go from zero to a hundred in two seconds, that she would get angry very quickly, even though he said he never saw that t that side of Shanann, but his wife would tell him that she would scream at her so bad that she, his wife would be in tears. And then one, the other, you know, the sonogram, when he mentioned it again, he just said, after five weeks, she sends this. She hasn't talked to us in five weeks. She sends this to us. Like, all of a sudden, she wants to talk now. We see that a very, you know, Ronnie has no problem with going in there and saying these things that he knows only through his wife, that he's never witnessed for himself, that Chris has never even told him, the same way Mark has. So Cindy has quite an influence over everyone because nobody thinks maybe Cindy might be making this up. Maybe Cindy has an agenda, right? Nobody's even, nobody even thinks me. Cindy's not telling the truth. Everybody's just believing Cindy because it has to be true if Cindy's saying it. Has to be. So that interview ends and we're going to go to Frank Rusak Sr. So Frank comes in and you know they ask him how he's doing and he says he's hanging in and the investigator apologizes you know and offers his condolences and asks him at first if there's anything that he wants to say and he says I guess and Frankie Jr reiterates that there was some type of person that created a profile of Chris Watts and was sending them friend requests. And he said, I'm surprised my wife hasn't called me screaming because she probably got one too. And you know, that it's just somebody just trying to mess with them, which why would you do that? But yeah, he starts getting Frank's personal information and then he starts talking to Frank and Frank said, you know, they say, well, wh what was Chris like? He was a great father. I couldn't ask for a better father for those kids. He was a great husband. I couldn't ask for a better husband for those kids. I never noticed anything um, amiss with Chris. Amiss with Chris. I, I never noticed anything, you know, with Chris that would ever raise any red flags for him. His daughter never told him of any marital problems. He didn't know of any financial problems. He didn't know of anything about even considering a separation. He didn't know about an affair. He didn't know about any of that. He found out that through Shanann's friends after, you know, after this all happened. And he said that he's not going to come in there and tell you another story because it's all over Facebook how I guess he and how his daughter felt about this guy they thought he was a great guy. And so he said, I'm not going to just go ahead and just say he's a horrible guy just to say it because I'm not going to do that. And um, he said the only thing he noticed about Chris, that when Chris came out to North Carolina, he was a little bit more standoffish and that he had noticed in some Facebook chats prior to that, I um, mean FaceTime lives, that. Shanann did every night for the kids to see their father that he would hear sometimes Shanann say are you going to pay attention to the kids Chris and he just figured maybe Chris was watching something on TV or, or whatever he didn't think it was anything you know but looking back now all these things are coming you know ringing a little bit true to him and he said that when he he was out in Colorado and flew to North Carolina with Shanann and the two kids so that she would have somebody you know, on the flight, and he said that he noticed Chris had become a little sterner with the kids, so he was yelling at the kids, where he wasn't, he didn't ever do that. 
he didn't notice that Chris ever hit the kids or anything, but he noticed that he was a little sterner. So he just said, well, maybe he's just getting a little firmer with the kids. You know, he's not going to let these kids walk all over him, whatever that is. But now looking back, he's saying maybe he was becoming detached from the kids. Maybe he was getting angry or resentful f with the kids. And maybe because the kids would cry for mommy and that kind of, he said they used to cry for daddy all the time. As something happened, they started crying for mommy and maybe he was becoming resentful of that. You know, that's one of the things he was saying. So, um, when Chris got to North Carolina, they noticed that detachment. He knew about the problems with the parents. He said Cindy didn't like, Cindy didn't like Shanann from the get-go. And they didn't go to the wedding. But he didn't have bad things to say about Ronnie. He said he, he knew that Ronnie loved his grandkids. And it was like a competition, he said, when Shanann would post a picture of the kids, which grandfather would get on there first and say, you know, which comment or whatever. So he said, yeah, I think, you know, he really loved those kids, Ronnie. And when he was with them, he would color with them. He would get on the floor and play with them. And so he didn't say anything negative about Ronnie. He did say that, Chris's parents were different and it could be Chris and his parents were different and it just could be that people are raised different ways but he said we meaning his family ha we have hearts and we have emotions and so again what he's describing is this hollowness this emotionless you know really not I guess your heart's not in your grand, like your heart would kill you to miss, you know, your son's wedding or, you know, you'd, those kind of things. Now I'm putting that in there, but that's what he said. We have hearts and we have emotions, but it's all a matter of how you're raised. And, you know, he just thinks that that was it. So Chris wasn't like that. Chris wasn't very emotional. He had a hard time showing emotion. He didn't show it. Okay. And, but he said that when he went to Colorado, he spoke to the neighbor, Nate, the one that had the security cam. And Nate had told him that Chris had been parking Shanann's Lexus down the road, down the street. And he's like, why would someone do that? He goes, when I heard this, I was like, why would he do that? Shanann never wanted her car out of the garage. She got mad when he left it at the airport. She told him to take an Uber. He left it at the airport. There was a hailstorm. And he said, when I was driving them back to the airport, I said, he said, Chris, you better hope that Lexus isn't, um, doesn't have hail damage. And he said, well, if it does, I'll just file a claim with the insurance company. So, you know, that's what he said about that. And then he said that he talked to the kids on FaceTime, him and his wife, that Sunday night and Bella was eating cold pizza and she said, mommy's coming back. And either Frank or Chris said, yeah, she's coming back late tonight at midnight. You'll see her in the morning. And he said he didn't see Cece, but he heard Cece. Okay. And then he said, you know, he's a hundred percent certain that Chris killed Shanann when she was sleeping because she would have kicked him and fought him and he would be marked up. He wouldn't look like he does. Okay. And, you know, he just doesn't understand what it is, how he could do this. He doesn't understand Chris's explanation at this time that Shanann was killing the kid. So he killed her and then he covered up the crime. He said, you know, if this was my wife and she was, you know, had strangled my kids, he's like, I'd knock her out. I'd knock her out. He goes, I'd beat her down. I, I, I'd knock her out. I wouldn't kill her. And I'd call the police. You know, he's like, but the story just doesn't add up. Like, what is he saying? He's like, and my daughter would never do that to those kids. And it just, and he went on to say that, you know, Shanann was no slacker. At 25, she had a house bigger than the one in Colorado, which she sold. And then everything went into the house in Colorado she worked like crazy all the time since she was 16. She always took care of kids, always wanted to be a mother, you know, and worked very, very hard and had all these cars and the trips that that company Lavelle paid for. And again, that she was never to be called a slacker because she never was. She worked hard for everything. He said that she was sick for years. They didn't know what it was. And then they finally 
had her tested for lupus and it was lupus and that Shanann credits moving out to Colorado with the climate change and also the Thrive for feeling the best she had and being able to come off her lupus medication. She also suffered from migraines and fibromyalgia and I know Frankie Jr. said endometriosis and they didn't even think, I mean she had to have fertility treatments to have Bella and CC and she had some difficulties in the pregnancies there, but she got pregnant for the boy on his own. They were worried because they said, you know, your health comes first. We don't want something to happen to you. We really want to, you know, we, we're excited about the baby, but we, you, you know, you come first. We don't want anything to happen to you. So when she went out there, she went out there. That's why she went out for there for the six weeks because she wasn't going to be able to fly pretty soon and she wanted to come home and spend the summer. Originally, she thought two weeks and then she extended it and he said you know you think your mom and you can get along because her mother and her they loved each other but they butt heads you know how mothers and daughters sometimes do right because they're very similar so they would butt heads he said but just like him and his son butt heads because they're very similar so she said oh yeah I'll do it and mom's birthday's coming up so in which her mother's birthday was coming up towards the end of August it was like the 20 something if I remember she said but you know it'll be nice to be out there and all of this and he said if I had ever known that she was in any way scared to go back there or that he was doing anything you know I would have gone for with her and you know I'm sure he, he feels he wishes he could have stopped it but he said finding out that he was taking that car and moving it down the street what was he doing that for and he just said he was just doing things that were not things that he normally did and that when he left the kids with that sitter, he said he would never do that. He never left the kids with a sitter when Shanann wasn't there. So that was very out of the ordinary. And then he found out from friends later about that tab for, what was it, 68 or 80, 80 what was it, $68? For the salmon and the two beers. And so he said, you know, he found that stuff out through friends. He didn't know before, but... You know, it's all stuff he was hearing after the fact, but he was saying, like, that car coming out of the garage, what was that, what was going on there? Something was definitely wrong. And he just thinks that Chris had those five weeks alone in which to plan all this. He said, because he definitely believes this is premeditated. This is not something that happens at a spur of the moment. He said, I, he said, once I heard that Chris backed his car up in that driveway because that truck leaked oil, it was a work truck. She didn't even let him bring it into the driveway to wash it. He had to bring it to a car wash because it leaked oil and she didn't want the driveway, you know, stain, have oil stains on it. So when he heard that he was backing that up, he's like, you know, it just something's amiss. Something's really amiss. That and then when he found out, you know, he was taking her Lexus and parking it down the street. So all of that was not, you know, adding up. He said things didn't add up and he knew... He knew he did something. He knew Chris was responsible for doing something. He said how you see Chris in the courtroom is how he is. He's not an emotional guy. He's very just straightforward. Um, that's who he is. He said that when they went back, she went for a sonogram and there was a sealed envelope with the baby's gender and he kept asking Shanann, you know, what are you having? And he said he never, he never got to find out, not while Shanann was alive. You know, he found out after the fact. But, um, yeah, so that was pretty sad. He said that Shanann always did special things to announce a pregnancy, like go upstairs and read this letter and this and that. And that this time he told us about that video that you're probably all seen with the shirts and all of that. And he thought Chris seemed excited in that video. And maybe for Chris that is excited. Um, we're all seeing different things, but maybe that's as excited as he gets. He said he, fa he and his wife FaceTimed the kids every single night. They did it around dinner time because after that, the kids watched um, their Bubble Guppy show and then they went to bed and you couldn't interrupt them during Bubble Guppies. So they talked to them every evening. And unless he got home from work late is the only time he missed it because then the kids would be in bed. When he heard that the phone was left in the house, it was another clue that he said Shanann was that phone was attached to her hip. She was with that phone 24-7. She did all of her business on the phone. She would never ever leave without that phone and she would never ever leave without the EpiPen. And he also said that he had installed those locks on the garage door and on the front door, the ones like the hotel, so you can't open it to go outside and you can't come in if it's locked. 
for Cece because Cece was a little uh, explorer, right? And so he said when he heard that those were locked and he knew that the back door was locked, he knew that someone got her inside the house. And the only person that could do that was Chris. He said that Sandy had been trying to reach her that morning. And you have to remember, there's a report of someone calling the school. There's a time difference. So it's 10 o'clock in the morning in North Carolina when it's 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm not sure, but I thought I had read it with Sandy that had called the school. So if she was indeed looking for her daughter, she might have called the school to see if the girls were there because she didn't know where her daughter was. And she would tell Frank, she said, to text because sometimes Shanann would uh, ignore her call. He said, because my wife can be too pushy sometimes and she just needs her space, but then he couldn't get a hold of her either. And then Nicole called Sandy and, you know, said the cops were there and all of that. And that's, he said that there was no psychiatric issues that he knew of with Shanann, that she didn't have any postpartum depression. He's sure, like I said, that it was not a spur of the moment a murder, that he had all of that time to plan and this was planned out, but he doesn't understand why Chris would bring these bring his wife and his children into his work site, he said, because that was just strange, but we know why, because he had GPS on his truck, and if he went anywhere else, because um, her father was mentioning like canyons and things like that, but if he went anywhere else, it would be discovered on the GPS, and he had lost time, because he couldn't do it with the Lexus, because he had lost so much time, right? So, and then I get, and his neighbor would have caught him too. Like, why is Chris going out in the morning in the Lexus when he doesn't do that? So he was kind of stuck, you know, with where he could bring them. So then Frankie Jr. comes in and Frankie Jr. reiterates that, you know, Chris was a great guy, that he was in tears at his sister's wedding, that she had such a great guy as a husband and it was a brother to him and he feels sorry for him and he's praying for him and he's praying for the family. And this is, you know, right at, this was, I believe, at the first hearing, but that 100% his sister did nothing to those kids. And, you know, he doesn't know why Chris is lying. And Chris has never been in trouble with the law. And he must really, you know, be going through it now. And he said that, um, you know, his sister, he had went out there when Bella was born. And he had wished he had spent more time with them when they were down here in North Carolina, but that he noticed little things about Chris that were off, more standoffish, you know, not affectionate to, um, to his sister anymore. She was sick and vomiting that night and he was getting her a wet towel and all this. And Chris was just in the, in the next room. They were sitting further apart that they were at Bojangles or they had brought Bojangles back. And, you know, Chris was scarfing down the coleslaw and there was only, they ran out so there were only like six, somebody would have to be without, so he wanted to give his to Shanann and then he even said, okay, well Chris is southern, maybe, you know, he missed it so I'll let him just do it, but I guess he figures Chris should have offered it first to his wife, which he didn't, and just small things that, you know, he said, he noticed too that the kids were calling for Shanann. She went on the back porch to make a phone call and Cece and Bella went screaming like crazy until they opened the door and as long as they saw mommy it was okay and they went on to playing and he just said to Chris, wow what's up with that? You must be chopped liver or something. Chris said yeah. So there was a distance with the kids and then like I said Frank had noticed he was doing that yelling at the kids more, being more stern with them which he just thought was more stern but now could be, you know, pulling away, detaching himself from the kids. And let's see. So Frankie said that, you know, Frankie just said that he had texted with Chris's sister, even though everybody else was blocked on Facebook about when they first went missing. And, you know, he's telling her, keep us in your prayers. He's being very nice to her. We're family. We're this, we're that. And um, then he said, you know, when, he, when they found out, his father, his mother, and he, Frankie and his mother were inside the house. His father was out back or something and saw it on the computer and started screaming. And then he blocked Jamie because he wrote something, you know, he didn't want her to see about this. But, you know, now he's here, he's saying that, 
he's been suffering from depression and then he says to the cuff you know they said there's somebody maybe that we could see her a psychologist or a psychiatrist because I'm not sleeping well and I'm not doing well and you know where they're getting the victim you know victim help for little uh, mistress they just gloss over it which is really really crazy and he goes well I guess I'll, I'll wait the four days till I get back to North Carolina and see a doctor there and then he's like yeah see somebody okay um what else yeah that was Frankie was just you know they just had a much better attitude and when you think about what the horrific thing that the Watts's son did to their family and then trying to blame it on their daughter and both of them are you know not going to let that taint anything they say and then you have by contrast Ronnie Watts coming in there, and before they can even ask for his name, she's a very controlling woman, and reiterating what his wife says, not even what he himself says. And I think that speaks volumes of the character of, of, of Ronnie, of Ronnie. And uh, I mean, come on, think for yourself, Ronnie, okay? Stop, stop parroting what your wife said. What did you see, Ronnie? What did you see? And the same thing for Mark. Mark, grow a set. Okay? Don't tell me what Cindy told you. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know, that's just things didn't add up for both of them. Frankie has all these different scenarios he's going through, like what could have happened? Could there have been a fight? Could the kids have witnessed it? Could he have killed the kids after that? But then he said, you know, strangling people takes time. You've got time to change your mind. You've got time to snap out of it if it's a moment of rage, right? Not to just go from person to person to person. So yeah, he, he would just like to know what in the world and he would have liked to know, you know, he said apparently he had a girlfriend. Remember this was happening, these interviews were happening pretty much right on top of that confession. And he said, I wish I would have known about that out here. I would have, uh, you know, busted his butt and see what I could get out of him. And that maybe that Shanann had said anything, even if she had assumed it, you know, just let them know. But they didn't. And, you know, so that that's where that is. He doesn't want to imagine scenarios. He keeps praying to God they get out of his head, but he keeps seeing his nieces and his sister's face all the time. And he says, you know, as bad as it is, you know, I imagine, like, what if something in a moment of rage had him kill his sister, but then he said he went on, he killed these two little girls. You know, it's just, it's unfathomable to them. So, just that, yeah, that was his only sister, and, you know, they're gone forever. So, it's just, he was in a depressed state before this, and, these, you know, Frank Sr. was saying they had their good days, they had their bad days, and they had just had, like, of some really really bad days so you can offer prayers and you know peace and everything for the Rusak family because not only are they going through that but then they're having you know Chris first accuse Shanann and then Cindy and Ron Ronnie going on TV and doing interviews where they're saying they believe the first story not you know I, I'm sorry so, yeah, I mean, just think about dealing with all that, with all the grief that they're already dealing with. But guys, I'm going to let you go because I want to get this video up tonight and it's already late. And I want to find out which case you guys would want me to cover after this. I, like I said, I understand if you need your fix of the Chris Watts case and I'm not going to abandon it completely. I will go through other aspects of the case and bring that to you. But I also want to focus on another case as well. So let me know whether you want to do Casey Anthony, Jody Arias, Betty Broderick, Joel Steinberg, or Susan Smith. Let me know which of those you want to do and just give us a little bit of a break from the Watts case. And don't worry if you feel like you're going to be jonesing if <laughs> for your share of the Watts case and discussing that and getting into that and looking into it a little more. Don't worry, I'm not going to abandon it completely, but I want to look at some other cases too. So let me know out of those five which you'd like to discuss. And like I said, I will of course be bringing you any updates on the Kelsey Barrett case as that continues and 
So far, you know, I don't see anything with the nurse being charged, but I think definitely we're going to see something. Yeah. Just, uh, what did I see? Did I see anything that she was like some rodeo queen or something when she was 16? And then they showed this picture that looks nothing that like what she looks like now. I don't know what, it's almost like one of those things that somebody posts on an online dating site and then you go to see them and you're like, when was that picture taken? Oh, 20 years before? Oh, good. I'm glad you used a recent picture. But yeah, something like that. So, which she looks nothing like now. And thanks for the commenter that told me the name of the person that was against the fence that quickly I thought was this other one. But yeah, she looks a lot older than 32 to me. A lot older than 32. So anyway, guys, take it easy. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let me know what other case you want to take a look at first. And I will talk to you very soon. Bye-bye now.